Well, I, as a uh, new commander of the uh, uh, first COSCOM at 18th Airborne Corps, uh, 6,000 men uh, and, and women, uh, military organization, uh, getting ready to go to Panama for the invasion of Panama, uh, I was not delighted when the news came down that I was going to be moving to Philadelphia. Um, I also had no idea in the world what a DPSC was. I wouldn't know it if it walked past me on the street. Uh, so I was not uh, at all encouraged to, uh, to make the change. Uh, it happened. Uh, I went up there and, uh, and both Patsy and I fell in love with uh, DPSC, Philadelphia, and, uh, and surely the workforce was up there. Enjoyed. It was a wonderful, wonderful uh, command and, and opportunity. Uh, from, the, from every aspect, uh, the people were terrific up there. The mission was huge. It was a $4.4 billion a year uh, uh, operation, uh, bought uh, medical supplies, clothing and textile, and uh, subsistence for all the services. So it was a huge responsibility. We had people all over the world. And then, of course, after being there, uh, I don't know, I guess four or five months, Desert Storm, Desert Shield cranked up. And we were full time into what we had talked about doing our little motto, think war and uh, getting ready for uh, warfare. Uh, I had mentioned that uh, we got into uh, the Desert Storm, Desert Shield uh, uh, shortly after getting there within four or five months. Uh, it's interesting that uh, when, the, uh, when the first warnings came up of getting prepared for Desert Storm, Desert Shield, remember there was about a four or five or six month buildup before we actually pull the trigger uh, on the actual operation. The, uh, I was out of town. I was off at a course, a capstone course, that all uh, new general officers had to go to. And so I was bouncing around the Orient at the time. And uh, probably three weeks after all of this started, I got back to town. The, uh, the workforce, command centers were up. Things were cooking. Those guys knew how to do that stuff. Uh, they had done Panama and other operations. Nothing like Desert Storm, Desert Shield, because it went so long and the support was so immense. It was, uh, it was an incredible undertaking. And those folks didn't miss a lick. Uh, there, was, uh, oh, there was all kinds of crisis. To start with, we changed. Uh, we, we didn't have any sand-colored camouflage uniforms in the military uh, to talk of it all. We're, we're talking huge numbers of troops that went to uh, the desert. I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but it was at least a half a million troops we sent over there. And we didn't have, uh, you know, three sets of desert uh, uniforms for all those folks. So we had to get cranking on that. And uh, our little clothing factory right there on post, our 1,200 wonderful people that worked over there, uh, jumped to that thing. We were producing 100 sets of camouflage uniforms a day while we were, while we were working to bring the contractors online, the big manufacturers. They were doing, you know, they were doing hell a hundred times that a day once they got cranking but we were that vital three percent that got things cooking and moving so we were able to within weeks to start shipping uh, supplies uh, in uniforms and that the medical folks tremendous amount of uh, work on not just all the types of medical supplies but vaccines and critical shots uh, that you needed for going to the desert there was a very short supply I mean we were tracking units going to the plains almost getting the material air to them uh, very, very intense uh, times. Subsistence, the amount of food we had to prepare and get over there was uh, incredible. They wanted 60 days on the ground. I thought that was a very bad mistake to put that much over there, but that was what the, the sink wanted. That's what the sink got. In fact, we probably even went over that mark a little bit, but, uh, and loads of money. I think totally on contracts in subsistence, we probably had about $3 billion. We were able to, because the war ended so quickly, we were able to cancel about half of that right off the bat. But uh, it, was, uh, it was seven days a week, 24 hours a day, three shifts uh, to keep up with that. Uh, I don't think we missed a single mission that we were required to do. In fact, I know we didn't. Uh, and in most cases, uh, they went beyond what the, the mission required. The other thing I think they did very well, and this, this sounds uh, kind of more administrative, I guess, but we kept saying, listen, let's not win the battle by doing all this and lose the war because the day after all the excitement stops, the accountants start coming in and 
We better make sure we're documenting things correctly, good audit files, so all our decisions are audited and the contracts are put away properly. And boy, they work that lane too. We went from that 4.4 billion a year up to about 6.6 .6 total, I think, by the end of the time. So two plus billion dollars they, uh, they contracted in addition to our normal yearly work. They couldn't stop either, by the way. So a pretty phenomenal story. They really did a wonderful job. Yeah, the factory, uh, uh, the factory workers uh, that I mentioned in <clears throat> connection to Desert Storm, Desert Chill, I always had a special spot in my heart, I guess, for those folks, mostly seamstresses. And I think the number, the total number of folks we had in their accounting management was about 1,200. Uh, and lined up in huge bays where you could look across almost forever, you would think, and see sewing machines lined up and everybody working and materials stacked up everywhere. And <clears throat> very hard working and, and a nice group of folks. It was interesting when I got there, uh, I've always done sensing sessions where I try to talk to different groups of the, the workforce and ask them what's, what's good about the organization, what do you like about the organization, and what are some things that together we need to fix in this organization, not never the negative side of what's bad. And it's a, an interesting technique because in a very short period of time, within a day or two, you learn more about an organization than you would if you were there for six years. Uh, one of the cautions, though, that there were some people concerned about doing that in the factory because the people were peace workers and very busy, and I mean, their time was valuable to them. They got paid on how, how much they produced. And it would be a disaster to do that. People were not, uh, would not be friendly in that particular life. And I said, well, baloney, they're part of the organization, same as anybody else. And I held a sensing session with those folks to start with, and it was wonderful, very, very constructive. And then I started through the warehouse. And that was probably the nicest reception anywhere. Uh, Got to be careful don't get choked up because it was that. Uh, uh, it was it was very nice. I mean, God bless you. Welcome to town. Good luck. You know all of that sort of stuff. And the people were great. And we went over there. I mean, they just were on the tour from that that time on. Patsy spent time uh, with the folks over there, my wife, and so it was a very nice relationship. And they did a unbelievable job uh, during Desert Storm, Desert Chill. Some of the, the items that came out of, the, uh, out of those sensing sessions that I mentioned a minute ago, uh, it's just interesting when you listen to people, how many things that are kind of big problems in people's lives that aren't so really hard to solve if you just listen to them. And one of them was that there used to be a mailbox in front of the cafeteria right on the, the campus there. For some reason or another, that mailbox got moved outside the gate on the street uh, out there in, in South Philadelphia. The complaint was it was harder to get to, and the street wasn't always the most secure thing in South Philadelphia, and a lot of the women didn't like going out, especially with envelopes and packages to put into a, a mailbox. They had asked, requested, and for, I guess, some period of time been anguishing over that because this turned out to be a very significant because uh, I'd also check how many times each item would get a hit so I could line them up as to what's, what are people most concerned about what's the least thing. That turned out to be a pretty high one so I, I called my guys and I said call the post office get them move the you know move the mailbox back in here put it outside the thing there if there's a problem give me a call and I'll call the mail the post office but I want it done in two days and then I want you to put a happy face on the side of that to my department that was there, responsible to do that, responsible to listen to the folks, put a happy face on there and tell them how much you care for them, and that's why you did that. that, that office, not me. Two days later, there it was. It was that simple, rave reviews, people recognized right away, well, somebody's listening. The women, interesting, boy, I got ripped. The ladies got up and they said, do you realize how many ladies' rooms there are in the first floor of your headquarters building? And I said, honest to God, I don't. <laughs> they said, there's one. Do you know how many men's rooms? I don't, I swear. <laughs> there's three. And I said, okay, I think we can fix that. I said, we'll take a look at that one. So that went down on the list. And we closed one of the men's rooms and turned it into uh, another ladies' room, which turned out to be a, a very funny thing. We, for two weeks before that, we posted signs. On this date, this will become a ladies' room and not a men's room, you know, to make sure. And bigger than hell, at least two or three guys walked in there to screams and the confusion. 
it all settled down after about two days and uh, and again but it was you know little things like that that just kind of uh, one other quick one I guess if I could the um, when I got there and on those runs even before I took command it was a beautiful tower at DPSC uh, clock tower built in 1941 I, when the command went in I guess in fact I, I have some pictures of the, the tower being built and it has clocks that face east west and north on it three sides well, as I'd run around, I'd look up that clock tower, not one clock worked. And these are clocks that everybody in the city and people driving through look at. And you know, you got to wonder, if you work in an organization and if people look over your wall and they see the end of your compound and they see your clocks don't work, what they think of the workforce. Uh, at DPSC, I think we had about 200 military and uh, out of the 5,200 that we had, so most of the command was, was civilians, uh, and I didn't see a lick of difference. In fact, the dedication was extraordinary, and, and we couldn't have done all the things I mentioned earlier if that civilian workforce, who did, 99.9% .9 of it were uh, Department of the Army, DLA uh, civilians. Uh, incredible. Uh, some of the nicest relationships and friends uh, that we have uh, came out of that uh, organization. So it was... Uh, very rewarding and and the very very dedicated people uh, to say the very least I guess from a from a challenge aspect uh, was well a couple things I guess uh, I thought probably building the team there as a, I took that on as a big challenge in them days total quality management total quality leadership was uh, was important to get that kind of uh, theory and philosophy uh, on board and we worked that stuff very hard. The, the other thing was that, that think war philosophy that I was very concerned in making sure that you know our heads were all in the right direction supporting the soldier and, and they were. I mean this organization had done that before but I wanted to bring a little bit of the airborne flavor to that and uh, sense of urgency uh, to that so took that on as a challenge. Learning the organization and learning the business was a personal challenge because I just hadn't been in that environment to a great degree. I had, I had uh, one previous tour in DLA as a major for about five months in a defense contract management region in, in uh, Towson, Maryland, and then uh, left there after about uh, five months for another job uh, back on the military side. Um, so I think those things would, uh, but it was, uh, it was a hoot. I loved, uh, loved every minute of that uh, Job. Another uh, quick war story, if I could throw it in here, had to do with prisoners. We brought in, I think the number is about 35 prisoners to work on the compound, to do uh, maintenance for us, to help do maintenance for us, to do, uh, I wanted to do a lot of beautification of the area and the like. Um, and uh, that caused a little stir in the neighborhood and a little stir from my workforce because a lot of them live close by. and. Uh, these guys were, we were very careful in, in uh, how the people we selected, they were screened by the type of, uh, of uh, sin that they committed, I guess. But we had them come in in regular civilian clothes so that they didn't stand out and uh, they were allowed to use the cafeteria and they worked in specific des designed areas. And uh, while well, there was a little nervousness about that to begin with, there was never an incident, not one incident. And those guys stayed on for considerably longer, rotated different people, but they were between there's a halfway house kind of program with people coming out of prison that they go and they're allowed anywhere in the city and all that, but they have to report back to one, one area, one house. We were just before that. And so it was a pretty, these guys were all pretty. But we hired some of them. I mean, uh, we hired a, a guy that was a safe cracker who was a magnificent welder. <laughs> but these folks came in there and I saved 250000 I got $250,000 in labor a year because these guys were there, we were helping the community in a sense, and they did incredible work around that facility. Uh, if, if any old DPSC er uh, watches this tape, what I'm gonna tell you now, they'll laugh their heads off, because out in front of the headquarters, there was this mound of dirt, right up next to the fence, or a little kind of a park area, but it was a mound of dirt. And I, I was curious what was under that mound. Well, it turns out, we get somebody that knows the history of the joint, that under that is this old fountain that they used to have. And then we got pictures of the fountain. And it was closed down, I don't know, 10 or 20 years earlier because it had some leaks or something. Well, 
now I had these guys that didn't cost me anything to do things for me. So I had them, uh, I said, okay. And this was getting towards the end of my, my tour there. I didn't know I was going to leave as soon as I did either. I left after, I think, 15 months to become the quartermaster general down at Fort Lee. And I was told I was going to be there three years. Uh, didn't happen. And I would have been delighted to stay there three years. But so we had them dig this thing up. And uh, then I found out I was leaving. And I said, guys, I'd like that thing working at the change of command so that my replacement and I can walk out there and get our picture taken again. And so that became the big joke. And everybody's right. And this thing turned out, and it's still there. Uh, they even threw some fish in it. But it's a beautiful thing with fountains coming in from the sides. It wasn't a, a huge thing. But it had fountains coming in. It had a little fountain thing in the middle. And it, it was just nice because the workforce could use that and go out there and, and walk around that thing. You know? And it was just one more nice thing. In an area of, of Philadelphia that isn't all that attractive, these guys did a great job inside the compound. And that was just kind of the added touch. DLA, uh, the importance of DLA in, in the Department of Defense, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, that's a good question. The, uh, you know, and again, coming out of, uh, out of uh, 18th Airborne Corps and, uh, and the like, going into what amounted to the business side uh, of the military into DLA, uh, I had my questions coming in. Uh, but I'll tell you what, it, uh, the value of that organization, I think, is incredible. And its scope has grown and grown by commanders uh, over the years. Uh, Tommy Glisson did a wonderful job hooking it up with more in the joint arena, more, I think, closer to the, to the war fighter. Um, that's an absolutely critical role. Uh, it's great for the military guys that go into that because if they've never been exposed to the joint world before, they're now dealing with officers of every service. They're understanding everybody's problems. Uh, it is absolutely imperative that a command like that work and work well to support all the military forces. Uh, I see their role over time only, only expanding more and more. Uh, while services maybe draw down their logistics areas, they ought to go into a joint uh, arena. Uh, and the service focus more maybe on their core mission of fighting the war, put more emphasis over on the DLA side. The organization can surely do the job. They've proven it time and time again over the years. Uh, they need to be resourced uh, and taken care of properly to be able to do that job, however, over time. Just happy birthday and uh, at least 60 more. <laughs>